This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel with a program that's given over to painting and drawing from life. This is part two of a program which is called Spring Flowers in celebration of the season. And I brought them in and they were blooming just a little while ago in a garden in Babylon, my sister's garden. Um, working from life may seem complex, but it's actually far easier than working from the imagination or from photographs or books. Besides that, you don't get to put much of yourself in. Since <clears throat> I started this on part one, one of the buds has opened. And uh, I'm going to be correcting that right now because that's what happens when you paint flowers. That little bud is open <clears throat> more than when I started it. So, um, <clears throat> well, I've lost my voice and there's a frog in there somewhere, so maybe I'll just paint the bud and hope the frog goes away all by itself. <clears throat> The bud has changed its form. It is now rounder than it was when it was first when it first came into this warm studio, and it has become uh, fat, and it's on its way to becoming a flower, a full-grown flower. Um, these are the intriguing things about painting from life that they do change, and you have to be willing to go with the flow and change them as you go along. I believe that. Observation is the only way you're going to be able to get this effect. Also, the green um, that is in the in the um, the stem part of this flower is quite intense because it is in fact blooming and getting more intense as it becomes older. It's very pale in the beginning, but then it gets more intense as it gets older. So before this changes any more, I'm going to make sure that I put <coughs> in the shaft that is holding this. It's a kind of a gray, little sort of a nothing thing, but it's essential to the anatomy of the flower. And it comes over and uh, sort of becomes like a little hat over the entire thing, encompassing it in its, in its eventual stem. Uh, as you can see, it does not have to need to have a tremendous amount of, of energy put into it. It just needs to be the right color. And it can be just one, one swipe of the brush but one, uh, but the proper color. Uh, when I laid this out, the, I'm going to change my brush now to a smaller one because I'm going to be doing a very pointed um, rendering of this uh, bud that is uh, in you know, somewhat in the same condition as it when I when the other one was. This one hasn't bloomed. It is now still very pale, and it also becomes rather green rather quickly because it's still a bud. And the green I'm using is um, a combination of uh, cadmium yellow and cerulean blue. I think I've mentioned a number of times that I do not believe in using the green that comes out of uh, the tubes. They are too harsh, much too intense, and very un unreal looking. Uh, so mix your greens. Uh, yellow ochre and cerulean, cerulean blue is great. Cadmium yellow and cerulean blue is great. Most of the colors are great when you mix them yourself. Uh, all right, let it get, getting down to the little one that is directly below this, there is green appearing also here. It's dark underneath, and even though it's almost invisible, it becomes light on the top, giving you the, uh, the sense of a cylinder, which is what it is. Uh, the green of this particular leaf is coming down, and as long as I have green on my brush, I always believe in economy of movement, the green that is coming down here is going to be intensified with a little bit of umber because there are strong shadows being cast in this uh, with this studio lights. And so what is usually, what is actually a very pale green branch has turned out to be uh, quite dark because of the intensity of the shadow. Uh, however, uh, with a little cerulean blue, a little bit of cadmium yellow, and I'll get me my green, the, the paler green, for the rest of this leaf. But underneath here, where it folds over, it's very dark. And here it becomes, well, it needs a little bit more blue. It's a bluish green. So mixing colors, I think I mentioned this the last time I was doing this, is, the, is one of the problems for most people when they begin painting. And the only advice that I can give is um, experiment with the colors. Do not limit yourself to a palette of only uh, four colors, such as other, uh, other instructional programs have been doing. Get yourself at least 15 of the colors. If anybody is interested in knowing what kind of colors I'm talking about, write to me in care of this station. First of all, I'll know that I've got myself an interested audience out there. And secondly, I can be of some service and tell you what kind of colors 
uh, I believe are a good palette. Uh, this, uh, this leaf is being caught, the top of it is being caught by, uh, by the strong overhead lights and therefore it's very pale and one stroke should be able to uh, take care of these uh, lovely uh, spear-like leaves. There is um, there's no need to agonize over the leaves. The simpler they are rendered, the better. This is the one that I shortened a little bit for composition because I don't like to see leaves or flowers going out of a picture. And my, uh, my uh, still life that I'm working from here is actually the leaves are taller, but I but for the for the uh, composition, I want to include them inside inside the um, size of the uh, chosen canvas, and therefore I'm I'm um, playing with the uh, with the proportion. I'm shortening them just ever so slightly. With oils, you can now blend, which is what I'm doing up here, because the light is uh, is playing on this leaf and turning it from very very from very uh, dark to very pale, uh, all, all only possible through observation and clear understanding of what happens in, in, uh, in forms when shadows hit them. I, um, I realize that I've got a small canvas here and also a small composition, but just to dwell for a moment on small paintings, there is something really uh, very enchanting about small paintings. I have been doing them for many years and they have always um, been a, a source of tremendous pleasure and help in decorating uh, and, and doing wall arrangements of paintings. Small paintings um, are my advice to people who are beginning to paint because first of all uh, they, uh, with flower paintings, you can actually accomplish a great deal in one sitting, but they also, when you frame them, uh, they're, they are wonderfully easy to place uh, in, um, in a home environment. Small pictures uh, fit just about everywhere. So, uh, you know, the business of going out and buying enormous canvases in order to become a painter, I think is a mistake. It's got to be... Uh, it has to be thought about very carefully before you start buying 20 by 24 inch canvases for compositions for the beginning. They should, you should limit your sizes to something comprehensible um, and manageable. There, um, there's tremendous time involved in doing large pictures. There's also a problem with um, the time that you would have to devote to uh, doing this composition and also to the fact that if it is a flower painting it is going to change t dramatically over um, a short period of time. So the smaller the painting the better. I see that there is a division here in this leaf at the top giving it the, uh, the correct anatomy of this particular uh, spear-like leaf. The fact that it has a shadow in the center tells you the construction this this can be slightly darker and pulled over this way. Well, now I'm going to uh, continue f with um, the uh, the intense concentration on these petals because they're not quite been finished as far as shadow is concerned. I've changed my brush because I've got some smaller brushwork to do. Um, the shadow color, for instance, on this is become different than what it was because the flower has changed. It has opened somewhat. So I'm going to change this particular shadow, and it may seem insignificant, but it's vital to the general composition of this flower. The, uh, I think you'll see when I get the, uh, the brilliant um, color in there that it will uh, be comprehensible as to the changing of it. That's why doing these things in two parts is very interesting to me because I can talk about the, um, the problems of uh, flowers uh, changing shape. As a matter of fact, um, Portraiture is the same thing. One can have the same, uh, uh, someone come and sit for a portrait, and then the next time they come, uh, there is a difference um, in the way they look, either the expression or the hair or the general um, comportment of the body it changes. So one has to be willing to uh, revise an original drawing, either of a flower or a person. As you can see, I'm working on shadows here because they are vital to the uh, uh, understanding of the construction of these flowers. Um, there is a wonderful shadow that is falling across this bud here, 
and giving um, the information that this bud is of, is of the shape that it is merely by the shadow that it is casting. It also is now becoming more of a flower, so it's no longer as pale as it was. It's got some bright yellow in here going towards the green part. And um, only possible with oils can you get this kind of... Um, this, oh, I need a little bit of more pale in there. This is much paler than what I have it, so here we go. And as you can see, the, the color selections are crucial to the uh, understanding of these, uh, of these flowers. There is a shadow that is crossing it in another way. It's doing this, and uh, the, um, the observation of that comes because I've got, the, uh, I've got the composition right here in front of me. No need to guess at it. Once again, there is some green at the stem of this bud, which uh, blends somewhat into the, um, into the yellow, but it is distinctly very, uh, very vibrant green. And it has a shadow of its own. So uh, there's, a little, uh, there's a little pale yellow one that is peeking out from the back here. Uh, and it, the, the shadow is in the, fr is in the beginning of the bud, which is all very peculiar, but that's the way it is. So the light part is back there, and the darker part is in the front. Uh, a reversal, but obviously it's a shadow is being cast from another flower onto this one. And there is the, um, here is the, uh, the manner in which I'm going to handle the shadow on this particular bud. The prepared background I spoke about when I first began this uh, in installment number one is because uh, the um, painting of a background, if you've chosen to do a plain and uninterrupted uh, background, it is, uh, it, the time does never allow to simply paint a, um, a flat background. There's no point to it. So I prepare it, and that's an acceptable uh, method of um, doing flower paintings. You can, in fact, um, uh, pre-paint the background. It's done, it's done very often. It should be properly, nicely painted, uh, and it should be uh, thought about carefully so that the color selection is, uh, is right. I like to have a very neutral background for flower paintings so that the color of the flowers can be, uh, can be enhanced just by being against a sort of a, a gray, nondescript background. Um, I'm going to enhance, uh, oh, I need to have my green uh, area here that uh, obviously makes this flower possible to grow. It's back here and it has some light on it. And so it makes it quite pale green. And that's, it's curved and meets the flower. And then I believe that, uh, yeah. So I gotta get some dark in there to, sh to show you how it curves and turns. The, um, the small, the details of the construction of these, of these objects, which is what actually what they are, is vital to the, um, to the general uh, understanding of a flower painting that looks complex, but it's been taken step by step. In here is the only time that is going to, there's going to be need to have uh, what you call, you know, irritating small uh, work with a very small brush to get the green from the leaves in, into, the, uh, into the background of this composition. You can't ignore it, and it has to be there, but it's, go it also, got to be, um, it's also got to be carefully handled, and you can't do that with the background. Here's this one coming down here. I'm going to take a break now because I have a need to squeeze some more color on this palette, so don't go away yet. I'll be right back.
back again to complete phase number two of this little composition of spring flowers. Um, it's a lovely time of year to start thinking about doing this kind of thing. And it's also um, very cheap as far as the subject matter is concerned. You don't have to go out and buy these flowers. You can find them growing uh, either in your garden or your neighbor's garden or at the supermarket. Supermarkets are beginning to look like little botanical gardens at this point. Uh, and flowers are, as I said a little bit earlier, have always been intriguing to painters and also uh, invaluable in the, um, in the decoration of a house for if, if original art is looked for in a house, there is no reason why uh, an attempt could be made by people who have had a feeling, I think I want to paint someday, to start trying to paint uh, a flower. Uh, uh, my, my little sessions here at the Cable Easel are supposed to help that kind of, um, of a, well, a wish or a, or a thought process. And maybe what I'm doing here is to give a little bit of what kind of an attitude you could have about starting flower paintings. The attitude, of course, should start off with fearlessness to uh, say, well, uh, if she can do it, then maybe I can do it. Uh, the thing to do is to get to it and to get the flowers set up in an area where you know that you can work without any interruptions and to um, just bite the bullet and sit there and try to do it. Uh, one must know how to draw somewhat before you start this kind of a project. So to just, to just jump in and say, well, I'm going to do a flower painting and not understand how you draw, uh, it would be, probably be wise to uh, begin a, um, a little bit of an approach to doing drawings of these flowers first. Uh, there's no doubt that you cannot, uh, you can't just jump in there without some fundamental knowledge of how they are constructed. All right, I'm going to now deal in the last uh, few moments uh, that we have of this thing, uh, of this program, to show you how to go about uh, doing a vase. Now, you're not going to be doing a vase because it's not, a, it's not an item for sale in a catalog or on one of these uh, buying channels. This is a vase with very definite patterns, quite beautiful, and it occupies this area. There's a large daisy in, uh, facing you, and then there's a little garland of flowers here, and the rest of the daisy there. And this has to be done uh, fairly accurately, but also in a very interpretive way. The first thing that I think should be done is to put the color of the vase, which is a kind of a creamy white, but I'm going to make it pure white. Um, this is the um, this is the, uh, the, the, the vase color before I've put in the decoration. Uh, it's uh, lit on one side, therefore this side is going to be pale, and it's going to blend around the corner to, so that it's slightly darker. We're dealing with the same sort of thing. We're dealing with a pale um, object uh, that has pale shadows, but the shadows are vital to give it the third dimensional quality. So here's the, here's the bright pale color, and then it's virtually almost the same tone of sh shadow that the flowers have had because they're both sort of creamy white. Um, the uh, form of the vase is vital and the, uh, the, the decoration is less vital. The vase has to have a, um, some sense to it. Up here where the flowers are, it falls into shadow rather quickly and that should be uh, paid attention to with as little, as little um, agony as possible. The, um, the whole concept of this, where's my small brush? There it is. I'm going to use pure black because uh, something that I rarely do except for decoration. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to use pure black later. I'm going to put that to daisy in right now because even though it's, um, well, of course, I'm in trouble. Uh, all I need to do is to get a clean brush, which I keep talking about. The brush has to be clean and the daisy is pale yellow. So mixing up the yellow on my palette, this is a study apparently in springtime yellow. I'm going to give you a general feeling of what this daisy is about. It is, it is to be treated almost uh, like a graphic uh, because uh, that's exactly what it turned out to be. It is nothing more than porcelain decoration. You are not interested in having it in, in enormously um, refined detail, but it has to tell the story of what, what little decoration there is on this vase. There is another one that has a pinkish tone over here, and it's only half the daisy. So, half a daisy. So here we are beginning to show you how the, um, the vase decoration is important. The container in a, uh, in a composition is, uh, is as important many times as the flower itself. Um, do not pick an ugly container with which to do, um, 
to do a, a composition because you'll regret the container. It's ugly. So try and find uh, a pretty container with some interest to it. One of the things I suppose to avoid if you're a beginner is to uh, start to try to do glass. Glass is, uh, is really... Uh, is a, a, a very difficult and has to be handled with, with some experience. As you can see, I did not bring glass in because it's far too complex to talk about and far too long, uh, time consuming. But this sort of thing I do believe is probably um, uh, possible within the realm of people who are observing what they see. So I have the daisy. It's being surrounded with the black now. Um, I would, may have done this in a different manner if I were doing it uh, in my studio, but this is um, adequate to show you how to handle the decoration of a little vase like this. And then the last thing that I think that we're going to probably have to deal with is the shadow which is being cast by these multiple lights overhead. But I, I do believe that even though you may pick a vase like this and say that it would be too hard, the, uh, an interpretive approach to it is probably the best idea. Uh, there's a little, there's a little interest here, and it, the the, uh, the black is quite dramatic. This vase belonged to um, to uh, my sister's um, mother-in-law, and it has done the tour of the family, and it's gotten lost and almost broken, and somehow it has a life of its own, and it never seems to um, do anything but suddenly appear. So maybe the elves have been at work and saved this vase from being broken or lost among members of the family. It's a, it's a charming little piece. I believe it's French. Uh, so uh, now so there's, some, there's some green also in this decoration. And uh, that can be handled, oh, you know, almost, almost n with no effort. Very little effort to be put into this, into this. And the little garland of flowers that comes below it and goes around is b b probably all that it needs to have done to it. The, uh, the shadow of um, the vase is going to be vital to anchor this into a particular place instead of having it uh, floating in a, in a background that has no, no, uh, no pattern to it. We've got to anchor this whole uh, piece with shadow. So let me get my uh, brush out and show you that even though this is on a, a, a sort of a black cloth, which is not really, it's black in itself, but it does not show black. And here is the table upon which this, um, this uh, vase is standing. I'm using a kind of a deep gray to uh, give you the horizon line of the table. It's going to be perfectly straight across, very classic. Mo many flower paintings are handled this way. And the shadow is here going on. I don't mind if shadows leave the picture. Shadows are fine if they leave the picture, but they must be um, they must be uh, there in order to uh, at least uh, at least hugging the vase. You have to have the shadow. So the cloth itself, uh, although is black, appears to be just a dark gray. And I believe that when the when the um, the black goes in, you'll find that the uh, the color of the cloth is made clear by the shadow which is cast on it. So here is the dramatic. This is the one dramatic thing about this particular composition: is the um, is the highly decorated vase and the shadow which is being cast on the uh, black cloth. There are um, there are a number of ways of handling this uh, shadow, but I do believe that you'll uh, agree that. You don't have to make a big point of it. It just has to be there. And the flowers also, they're sticking out, cast a shadow of their own in, um, in a kind of an arbitrary pattern. Just observe what you're doing and don't question what you see. Just put it in. This is the other shadow because of the multiple lighting. Usually, if you're working in your own uh, environment, you do not have multiple shadows. You have a light source coming from one place, and that's it. So uh, the. Um, the uh, putting, as, as you can see, we don't need to spend a great deal of time on this kind of flat uh, painting of the, uh, of the um, table. But it's, uh, it's just a quick information for you to have uh, for the final uh, finishing of this particular composition. I'm going to naturally turn this over to my sister, who was kind enough to let me pick these flowers this morning. And uh, she deserves to have the painting given to her. Not that she doesn't have a house absolutely crammed full of my work. She does. Uh, but she seems to always want more. Uh, this shadow can be a slightly darker. Uh, I believe that uh, I have a few more moments in which I can sign. Yeah, I have one more. Well, that's, that's extraordinary to be able to uh, maybe have this painting done maybe on time. 
There's a little bit more going on on the side here, which which gives you some feeling about the end of this vase. All right, painting uh, paintings have to be signed, as we all know. It's going to be the final thing. I uh, while I'm signing it, we may run out of time, so just let me say that uh, I'm going to sign it in a pale color this time because I've got such a dark background. Usually in the lower right hand corner, usually in my own handwriting. If you can possibly do your own handwriting, then that's all to the good. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Well, there we are. I'll just put it right down here and show you that with a brush with an ink-like uh, consistency to the paint. You can, you should sign your paintings, usually just your last name, no periods, and um, the date if you have room for it, or if you, um, or if you've become skillful enough to do your name, you certainly should be able to do your, do the date for, uh, well, for historical records, who knows? It might be a painting that will be good enough to last hundreds of years and everybody's gonna wanna know what year it was done in. Um, with the exception of just sitting here and fooling with little final details, I'm going to uh, kind of sign off and say that I'm awfully glad you uh, tuned in on this program. I hope you got something out of it. By all means, find your flowers and paint them yourself. Stay tuned when you see the cable easel coming on. I think you'll find it's uh, an addition to some knowledge which you may or may not have had and which I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Pat Windrow. So long.